You're listening to the Inside the Mix podcast with your host, Mark Matthews. Hello and welcome to the Inside the Mix podcast. I'm Mark Matthews, your host, musician, producer, and mix and mastering engineer. You've come to the right place if you want to know more about your favorite synth music artists, music engineering and production, songwriting, and the music industry. I've been writing, producing, mixing, and mastering music for over 15 years, and I want to share what I've learned with you. Okay, folks, welcome back to the Inside the Mix podcast. If you are a new listener of the Inside the Mix podcast, welcome, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And if you're a returning listener, welcome back. Now, in this episode, I'm very excited to welcome my guest today, Brian Hazard, a.k.a. Color Theory. So, he is, or Color Theory is, a synth pop artist and professional mastering engineer with a passion for songwriting and producing, and has amassed more than 5 million streams across streaming platforms. Wow. And he's going to share with us a little about his background and several songwriting and music production pearls of wisdom. Hi, Brian, a.k.a. Color Theory. How are you? And thank you for joining me today. I'm doing wonderful. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Just for our audience listening, I always ask this now because the podcast has a, a worldwide reach. Where are you joining us from today? I am in Huntington Beach, California. Oh, brilliant. Oh, well, I, I, this is totally uh, a British thing to say now, but what's the weather like there? <laughs> uh, actually, it's it's not characteristically uh, Southern California. It's uh, it's overcast. Uh, it's in the now, don't don't make me do a Celsius thing. It's in the it's in the mid fifties Fahrenheit yeah. right now. So I mean, it's nice. It's you know, I'm running in a t shirt and shorts, but I do that all year anyway. So yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. It's um, it's, it's moderately overcast here, and I think it's about ten degrees. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. Um, <laughs> that makes yeah, two of yeah. us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, the fact is overcast. It's, it's, uh, like I said just then, the reason I ask is it's, it, the podcast does, I speak to people all over the globe and it's so cool that there's this platform available whereby you can have these conversations and it's uh, it's amazing. I'm always intrigued. I was chatting to somebody earlier in Singapore. Um, wow. So yeah, it's fantastic getting to meet people all over the globe. Um, brilliant stuff. So color theory. Tell our audience a bit about your sort of musical influences growing up. Um, which artist, song, or album sort of left an indelible mark on you and sort of for, made you forge your career, your pathway in music? Well, my first actual music purchase was the Eagles Hotel California on cassette. Um, I wouldn't say that that was the one that really got me into music, but that's when I started having enough interest in music to branch off from my parents. I think that was right around the time where they switched over to country music. Um, so the the album that really connected with me the most was, it's not going to be a big surprise, was Depeche Mode. Um, it was some great reward. And uh, my best friend and I, we would, like he he was always introducing me to music. We'd play the records. We'd like sit there and listen to music, right? I, I mean, imagine that. It just... Mm sit there with the sleeve open and the lyrics and you know pretty soon we're singing along and then sooner or later it's like okay well I'm going to do the higher harmonies when we're singing along I mean it's it's pretty silly um so I had somebody of course was the song that I I really fell in love with and I remember he had a typewriter I I know I sound really old (laughs) but it was it was old for the time too um his mom was a professional trans I don't know the the proper transcriber. <laughs> way to say it. Transcriber, yeah, is that really it? So um, for medical records and stuff. So there's a typewriter, and I love those lyrics so much. I um I typed them up, um, and I took them home, and I you know dubbed it to cassette from his record, and I listened to it all the time. So that was that was really the branching off point for me. Amazing. I love the fact you mentioned Eagles Hotel California as well because. Uh, as soon as you said that, it it sparked my um, my sort of nostalgia for my music influence. And when I started playing guitar, the the reason I sort of started playing was because I wanted to do the the guitar harmonies from Hotel California. <laughs> um, at the end, I still yeah. still haven't got around to actually doing it. To be fair, <laughs> <laughs> I then went and pivoted in various other directions. And then obviously you got the Depeche Mode influence there as well. And I think it's fair to say it's you can sort of hear that in your sure. in your music and. Um, We'll come on to that in a bit, but no, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. So, as as actually a musician, do you, do you have a, a particular instrument that you are sort of proficient with, or you, do you have multiple instruments? 
Yeah. Uh, well, I'm very, very proficient at the piano, more proficient than I need to be because I got, actually got a degree in piano performance. So essentially I went to school to be a concert pianist, you know, is what it comes down to, mm. is what my day looked like. So, uh, yeah, that's my main instrument. Um, I uh, played mallet percussion in the drumline and all the, and all the different instruments for different things. And I taught high school drumline for a few years. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm decent at percussion and, and can manage the drum set. I, I got through uh, rock band in expert mode, the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, can't play a lick of guitar. I think mm. at one point I could play um, Message in a Bottle by the Police, which was actually pretty impressive. And mm. I could kind of sing it, although my, by the end of the song, my voice was tired. Um, yeah, so that's about it for me. I, you know, I don't really consider myself a singer. Of course, that's the most important thing I do. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. It's, uh, it's an interesting, interesting one being a singer. Because I, I every because I write my own music as well, and I always toy with the idea, of thinking, you know what, can I sing? Should I give it a go? <laughs> um, at what point? Because I'm always intrigued by this. At what point did you think, actually, you know what, I, I, I can sing a little. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it down on a, on a record and see what happens. Oh no, I, I mean, I was always doing it. Like I had in, in high school, I was in a band called the Thought Chapter, which I named one of my albums after. Mm. Um, it's just me and a friend and his brother and, uh, and I, you know, I sang and traded off with, with him. And, uh, then I was at a band called European White Disco in college. That was kind of like Wham meets Duran Duran, if you can imagine that. Wow. And I sang back up. So I, I always sang, but I, I never, I'm not lead singer material. You know what I mean? Mm. Like I'm not going to go in, on a stage with just me and a mic and, you know, yeah. do, do the things. That's just not me. Yeah, yeah, I get you, I get you. Lovely stuff. I think what we'll move on to next then is sort of um, the, the main item, which is surrounding sort of music production and a bit of writing, songwriting about your, with regards to your music. So I think it'd be good to start off with with a song in particular. So uh, If You Want Me To, being the title of the song, um, mm -hmm. can you just break down for our audience sort of like the songwriting and composition processes or process for this particular song? How does a song start for Color Theory? Yeah, so... The the process between songs isn't too different, so, and I I don't want to bore you with a a huge uh, diatribe on this, but basically mm. I have a process and then I have a process I'd like to do but I don't do. <laughs> okay, so the process as it actually happens is you know like most people I hear about people having these unfinished ideas and people don't finish songs and you mm -hmm. see on YouTube like how to finish songs, that is not my problem. I do not have extra ideas lying around. Yeah. For, for me, uh, I have to deliver a song every month to patrons on Patreon. And with studio work, you know, you never know when that's coming in. And that's obviously priority. And so sometimes, you know, it gets really close to the end of the month and I've got to deliver a song. Um, so basically, I am writing and recording a song in about five days, the, the whole thing thing yeah um so okay so i always start from a production snippet and so that that's you know usually just like drums bass maybe some kind of lead arpeggio or synth line or just just enough there to establish a feel mm -hmm. and the reason i do that is you know naturally i would write at the piano and i did my first couple albums i wrote them at the piano and I think what I found is that I had like reviewers refer to it as an album of ballads. There's just something about writing at the piano that doesn't necessarily translate to, you know, a synth pop kind of context. So I think mm -hmm. starting with that idea and having a groove in mind makes it a lot easier. Um, so I've got that groove. Uh, as far as the song itself, I, I like to start from a title because if you've got a cool title, that's half the battle. Yeah. Um, Generally, from there, uh, I end up producing the entire instrumental. Um, so now I've got, I mean, every little bit, you know, even the, the you know, the transitions and sweeps and all, the, all that kind of stuff. Um, just because by the time I record vocals and work through the vocals and all that, like, I, I don't want to go back and, 
read, you know, and touch up the production and add the finishing touches. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so the, mel- the, the melodies now, I'm going to poke out at the piano or, you know, synth piano, figure that out, write some lyrics, record the vocals, mix it, and master. And for me, the mastering is not a drawn out thing. It's really just compression, limiting, and dither, and anything else that needs to be addressed, I'm going to go back in the mix and fix it. Okay. So, yeah, that's the process. Fantastic. Yeah. So I've, I find it, and it's fantastic that you've got the uh, the Patreon side of things going, and it, you, you've given yourself this accountability there to, to writing these songs. And I, lo- I love that idea. And then it's almost like, you, well, you have got a deadline, haven't you, to write this song yeah. for your Patreon, Patri- Patreon patrons. Um, and also the idea that you have no extra ideas lying around, which I think is interesting as well, because it sort of mirrors. I don't have a Patreon, and I'm not I'm not um, releasing music in in that sort of format. But it's I I personally as well. I don't have loads of ideas lying around. I sort of focus on one particular idea, or maybe two or three that are going to form a cohesive piece, rather than have multiple ideas. And um, I mean the fact that you you don't have loads of ideas lying around. Do you think that's why you find it so much easier to to finish a song? So you're not getting just distracted by sort of like shiny objects. This other idea that I've got over there. Um, how do you stay focused on one just one idea? Well, the the deadline is is very persuasive, as we mentioned. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I mean, it's been it's been six years now on Patreon. So that's mm. uh, what. 62 songs? Did I do that right? No, that can't be right. Yeah, that... Uh, I, why am I having trouble with this? No, 60 is five years, right? So mm, 72, 72 songs. 72 tracks. So it works really well. Before Patreon, it took me six years to do an album because I would just keep rehash. You know what I mean? You you finish mm. the last song and then you go back to the first song and you're like, well, that's not up to the standard of the last song anymore. I need to touch that up. And then you, you it's just an endless cycle. Um so yeah, I think I just sit down and, and do it because it's got to be done. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I'm probably not going to abandon an, an idea because even if the song isn't great, you know, it's still going to be up to a standard I establish. And if it's a patron exclusive, that's that's even kind of cooler. You know what I mean? Like then that's mm-hmm. something special that they get that nobody else gets to hear. Maybe a different side of me that doesn't, you know, kind of mesh with the public you know, profile. Yeah. Yeah. It's that, that's great. I, I love that. And I think the fact that you're releasing so many, so many songs, I mean, 60, what did we say? 72, songs 72, over, <laughs> six over, years. Over, yeah. yeah. Over six years is amazing. And I like the idea that you sort of, you plow on through and comp- complete a song. And it kind of mirrors the conversation I had with, uh, with Ed sunglasses kid before Christmas in, tw- in 2022, where he said the same thing. It's kind of like, you, you you might hit a brick wall or you might think, actually, this song isn't quite doing it for me, but just persevere and break through and write that song anyway because you don't know what's going to happen at, uh, on the other end, which I think is a great thing for our audience because I know I, I do chat and I interact with a lot of the audience and the idea of not finishing songs is one of their main pain points is, is finishing a song and also thinking, actually, you know what, I'm going to start something else because I've got a better idea. But <laughs> just, yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've fallen foul of that. But in 2023, I've made a point now of thinking, right, I'm going to write a song. I've got 30 minutes a day. I'm going to dedicate to songwriting and I'm going to break the back of the song and I'm going to get through and do it. And it, and it's, I'm reaping the rewards from it. It's, and the podcast does help. I speak to so many artists like yourself and it's great for me in the audience because I can take all this information, absorb it and pick the pieces I want and create with this, this amazing workflow, which is fantastic. So with regards to your composition, so we've, sorry, we've been through the composition process. So with mixing as well, so you've, you've, you're doing all that in five days. How do you sort of, the mixing process, how do you get it, for one of a better way of putting it, how do you get it done so quickly? <laughs> it's, it's not really a process. Um, so the, the best example of that would be, um, you know, I, I don't know if you saw this, I uh, released a cover of Depeche Mode's Ghost Again, Within 12 hours of them releasing it, no, um, I haven't. So, seen this. yeah. So I found out. Uh, I think I, I was emailing people who bought stuff on Bandcamp. You know, I like to 
send a personal email every time somebody does that. Mm. And somebody replied and then just mentioned, hey, the new de- looking forward to the new Depeche Mode single tomorrow morning or tomorrow or something. I was like, what? Okay. I, I, I mean, I knew they had an album coming out, but I try to stay away from social media. So I didn't know that it was actually coming out at that day. So I went for my run, came back, looked for the song. It wasn't there. And I saw on YouTube it was going to come out like in 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, um, you know, got a drink, hug out, heard the song. I was like, oh, I kind of like this. I, I think I could do something with this. And I just threw everything aside and there it is. So the, the mixing isn't really a separate process. Um, like I don't rough everything out with sounds and just hope to fix it later. You know, I've got to hear mm. how it's going to sound in context. So I'm always kind of mixing as I go. Yeah, I can see how that would make uh, sort of expedite the process and make it quicker. So with regards to mixing, are there, are, have you got any sort of like top tips for if, if for producers out there, the audience listening, who are writing and mixing as they go? Have you got any sort of top tips or maybe a top tip for producers, artists that are doing that? Well, I've, I've maybe a controversial one. So I've got just a load of advice that is me as a mastering engineer telling mm. clients to do so that their mixes are prepared properly. Perfect. The worst thing that they can do is to mix through compression and limiting because mm-hmm. they want to know how it's going to sound. I know this is controversial. A lot of people swear by it. Uh, what happens is they do that. And to me, if they're going to compress the whole mix, anything you do to the whole mix is kind of by definition mastering. In, yeah. in my opinion, right? Mm-hmm. Because that's it's done on the master. It's performed on the master. So if you're going to compress it before you give it to me, my hands are tied as far as I'm concerned. The, the attack and release characteristics of your compressor are permanently imprinted on the whole mix. I'm not going to be able to get the punch out of it that I want. So then, then and you know, I, I usually hear things like, oh, it's only like, you know, two or three dB, which is huge. Like, mm-hmm. like to give you a perspective, I use, um, Unisim mastering compressor is, is my, my main, uh, tool for mastering. And it's the most intimidating plugin ever. It's got, <laughs> it's amazing the way that you can fine tune the detection circuit at different frequency bands to respond to the mix, but it's only a broadband compressor. It's not multiband, but yeah. anyway, one of the features is you can, um, set a, a limit on compression. Um, so I have it set to 2 dB. Like it will never compress more than 2B, 2 dB because I've I've set that as a limit. So when people say, oh, it's just a couple dB before they send it to me, it's like, well, okay, I, I, there's nothing left. <laughs> yeah. So I would just, I just, my advice is always don't mix through compression and limiting. It's a crutch. Get it right in the mix. Um, so that that would be my number one. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. So what about, so a bit, not necessarily devil's advocate here, but sure. what about uh, producers that are mixing into, I don't know, some form of like, I don't know, tape emulation or something like that? Would you oh, advise- that's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Would you advise then like leaving that mix bus empty? Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. The, uh, so if you want, well, tape emulation, not so much. But I mean, if you mm. want, if you want some sort of glue compression, on the drum bus, I mean, go for it, of course. Uh, that's yeah, not yeah, what yeah. I'm saying. I'm not I'm not saying don't use a compressor anywhere in your mix. I'm just saying, of course. yeah, just not on the master bus. Yeah. Um, tape emulation is, you know, it's, it's compression, yes, somewhat, depending on how you hit it. It's adding harmonics, so it's a saturator, depending on how you hit it. Um, I, again, would say... If we want that color, it would be better for me to apply it after I do my other stuff. Yeah. Um, there's a really cool, again, in Unisim, there's a little kind of button called Higgy, I think is how it's pronounced. <laughs> I think it's like a, you know, a Scandinavian thing. I don't, I don't know. I think it means sweet or something. But anyway, it's just, it's just a little um, kind of transistor circuit that accomplishes a lot of the same thing. That I can, that just sounds amazing. That, you know, if I get something that's really cold and sterile, it doesn't happen much these days, but, you know, 
like I just mastered a 20 year old album and, and converters were different back then. So mm. I really helped warm that up. So I've got tools on my end, of course, to do that. And I would, I would just say, you know, what I do when somebody really insists on having that is I say, okay, can you send me the mix both ways with the tape emulation and without? And so I know what you're going for. And then I will do, hopefully prove to them <laughs> that it was better without, but <laughs> yeah, you know. Brilliant. So going back to what you said earlier then about uh, when you're mixing, so you're effectively and, and how, when you're mixing your own music and then you master it after thereafter, you, you mentioned there about you go back and fix in the mix rather than fix in the master. And obviously that is uh, that makes perfect sense. So just to touch on your, your mastering chain again of what you're using in your particular um, mastering, for our audience listening, and if they are doing their mastering at home, this sort of DIY mastering, have you got any advice? Yeah. Maybe again, a, a top tip if they're mastering their own music. Yeah. What would be your top tip there? Well, okay. Uh, so you, if I ramble, you'll need to stop me. But no, no, I've, I've got go a little ahead. bit of a, a preach it kind of thing. So I would, I would stay away from AI mastering at all costs. I actually consulted on Lander's Engine for a while. Um, and you've seen like the latest Ozone has basically AI mastering built in. Mm -hmm. um, so you get a little better idea of how it works. And um, it, those processes, and, and this is, goes for plugins like Golfos or Soothe2, mm -hmm. any of these plugins that are in real time pushing your mix towards a certain spectral balance that they've predetermined is appropriate for your genre, right? So if you've got this, you know, EDM preset, then they've, they've decided, like, here's a tonal shape for the whole mix that, that we see across the number of EDM hits, which, I mean, the, the methodology sounds like it makes sense, right? So yeah, yeah. we want it to sound like a hit, so let's just keep pushing your mix in that direction the whole time. Um, wh where it falls apart, though, is, you know, if you've got say the third verse, you drop the kick out for eight bars because, you know, you're trying to build up some tension and you want that to sound softer. Well, these plugins don't know that. So they're mm -hmm. going to push, you know, the, the low end up now to try to get you towards that shape that really doesn't apply anymore. Or yeah. if the hi-hat drops out, you know, what now? Now we got to push all the highs, the sibilance is coming up. So just philosophically, it just doesn't make any sense. So... Um, that would be the main thing. So, you know, ozone, like isotopes are really cool. Somebody from there emailed me like a few years ago and said, Hey, is there anything from our collection you want? And I said, no. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then I think just like a, maybe six months ago, I saw the latest one and there was, there's a tool in there. I don't know if you've seen this. It, um, you can specifically raise the level of the bass, the vocal, Yes. Or the drums. I have seen this, yep. And I was like, oh, that looks cool. <laughs> so I, I said, hey, does that offer still stand? Yep. They sent me a, a code for the, the full like top level ozone. So I've experimented yeah. with that. I've used it. I used it on that 20-year-old record because, I mean, it was basically, you know, it, it was thrashed. I was just trying to, you know, get, get what I could from it. And there were some really interesting tools there. Um, so the main thing there is if, if you're going to master yourself, like you don't have to use all the modules. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and think really hard if you need multiband. Like the real world is not multiband. We don't split things up and, you know, and bounce them off walls differently. Or You yeah. know what I mean? Like it's just, especially for for people in the synthwave world, we're trying to, you know, create an 80 sound with tools that didn't exist it, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense so i you know i use um, broadband as i mentioned with unison compressor i it has multi-band detection circuits but all the compression is broadband and i think that makes the most sense so i would stay away you know when if i'm going multi-band it's because i'm solving a problem you know the mm. the hi-hats like Maybe they're fine, but when the shaker comes in in addition to the hi-hats, now it's crazy loud. And so 
and, and I can't get them to fix it in the mix. The, the big thing with me as a mastering engineer, the, the difference I think between me and most people is that we go back and forth and fix it in the mix. And that makes my job easy. Like I'm not, I'm not here to show off all the cool toys that I have to, you know what I mean? To demonstrate the way that I can, you know, work around all the mm. problems you've created. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. I want to get it right. And then what happens is over time, then the people who work with me come back with better and better mixes and it's easier for everybody. So yeah, yeah I would just say, you know, if you're going to do it yourself, air less is more. Um, you Compression is the main sound, the main difference between a mastered mix and an unmastered mix. So you're going to want some compression. And of course, you're going to need limiting and dither at the end of the stage. And mm -hmm. um, anything else, if you can fix it in the mix, I, I say fix it in the mix. Yeah, great advice. Um, totally agree with that with regards to fixing it fixing it in the mix. And it sort of echoes a conversation I had a few weeks ago whereby we went through the phases of recording, mixing, mastering and how get it right at source when you're recording so you're not having to mm. fix it in the mix and then get it right in the mix so you're not then having to fix it in the master and it just made it just makes sense going back to what you said there about multi-band compression actually no before i move on to that bit i really like what you said about how we're we're creating music that existed in the 80s we're using tools that didn't necessarily exist and i'd never thought of it that way and i really like that idea and i think for the audience listening if you think about it that way when you next time you're producing a song just only use tools that might i mean you're not probably not going to have the necessarily have those tools to hand but maybe <laughs> limit yourself to tools that you think would have been around in that particular time and see what you come up with i think that's a great idea so with regards to multi-band compression why do you think multiband? Because I've heard uh, a few people say that now, audio engineers, mix engineers, mastering engineers about multiband compression and how not, I mean, you, you can use it, but they kind of recommend not using it. Why do you think there is uh, a, a sort of a pocket of people that like to push multiband compression? Yeah, I, I don't know. I I keep up, I lately I've tried to keep up with quote unquote, modern production techniques, mm. you know, watching because I, I honestly, I kind of stopped <laughs> upgrading my tools doing and and this is another discussion for later, but hardware mm. since I hadn't kept up with at all for like 20 years, basically. So lately, I've I've kept up with uh, hardware tools, you know, doll list kind of setups and and those and just since and with the latest plugins and that's why I, I just feel uh so adamant against some of these you know uh tools that are there to tame what they call you know nasty resonances mm. which if if you'll permit me just to <laughs> explain that a little more because yeah, that's go, go i feel it. like that is so key like people now i see it everywhere like i just saw a little um uh, a mix demonstration from the guy who mixed the weekends after hours and it's on the site called Mix with the Masters, which, yeah, yeah it looks cool. So he goes through the the chain, uh, the mastering chain and the vocal chain. And, and I mean, it's amazing to me the record sounds as good as it does, uh, you know, because he goes through a clipper and he's got, um, but he's got Gullfoss on the master. And you just see that thing, like it's got this huge spike pushing up at 12K, like the whole way, bobbing wow. up and down at 12K. And it's like, you know, in Gullfoss, you can actually restrict the frequency range so it doesn't, you know, that's obviously not what we want. <laughs> um, so, but here's the thing. Okay, so acoustically, this idea of resonances being a problem just doesn't hold water. You know, if, if I'm singing, if the song is in the key of G mm -hmm. and the bass guitar is playing a G and I'm singing a G, you're going to see frequencies that correspond with G yeah. all over. That's what we want. <laughs> that, that is a feature, not a bug. We don't need to tame that. So if I, let's, let's turn this around. What if I said to you, hey, I have a tool that will turn up every note that is out of key with your song. Would you like to use it? I hope that you would say no. <laughs> <laughs> I would I would say no to that. I but, would say no. Yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. But that's what we're signing up for. So, and now I lost yeah. what the question was because I'm just uh, so passionate I, about this. Yeah. yeah, I think it was. It started off with multi band compression. Yes. And why? Why? Uh, why? It's uh, some some producers, engineers, etc. Are advocates of multi band compression, 
Um, but what you said there about resonance is is fantastic. Um, but yeah, it was multi band compression. <laughs> yeah, I I um, I can see. Yeah, I see it too in Ableton. Like a lot, uh, they split it up uh, with that. You know, there, there are built in audio. I don't know. You use Logic, I think. I'm trying to yeah, remember. Yeah, I, yeah, I do. Yes, yeah. I I own Logic. I bought it because it's cheap or I was one ninety nine and I mm. bought it because I had clients that I was like, oh, you know, use logic. Great. Send me your project. I'll mix it in logic. And man, just trying to learn two sets of key commands, it it does not work. But um anyway, yeah. So the multiband thing, I mean I used to kind of experiment with it in mastering and it it was interesting. It's it's arbitrary of course where you chop up the bands and it can kind of make sense. Like if you Let's say you're recording a vocal and the vocalist is too close to the mic and you've got proximity effect and that's coming in more on the lower register. Well, then sure, uh, there's a particular frequency range that really is the problem. Let's do that. Another option then would be a dynamic EQ, right? Where you can fine tune just that frequency range and not necessarily chop up the whole spectrum into bands. Mm. Um so, I mean, obviously there there are times where you want to treat certain frequency ranges and not others dynamically, and that can make sense. I just don't like – I mean, the worst was back in the – when the L3 came out, the Waves L3, right? Yeah. So you had the multiband limiter, and it, you know, I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. And you turn it up, and it's like, oh, where did my bass go? You know, it just – yeah, right? Because most of the energy is in the low end, so it just it, – um, yeah, so I, I would say that not to never use multiband, but to think really hard about why you need it for this application. And um, and there are applications, but I very rarely reach for it. Mm, yeah, fantastic. Thanks for your insight on that. I'm, I'm always intrigued because I get, like I said earlier, I get to speak to so many different people and you see all these different resources. And um, it's it's quite nice when I get... You, you hear different sides of, of the uh, the coin, so, so to speak. I think I mixed metaphors there. Um, <laughs> but, but it's interesting you mentioned dynamic EQ because that was going to be a question of mine, actually, what your thoughts are on dynamic EQ. Because I've, once again, I've heard some uh, some individuals sit on the fence, but some are pro, some are against dynamic EQ. I mean, is, is what are your thoughts on dynamic EQ? Uh, again, I rarely use it. I'm thinking about I have one uh, bluegrass singer that I work with, I've worked with for many years. And she's got a, there's little kind of, nasal's not the right word. It's above nasal, but it's not a tone that creeps into her voice that I find, you know, her most uh, pleasing asset. And so I will t- sometimes hit that in Pro Q3 with a dynamic band. The difference is, so you can set um, with Pro Q3, you, if you just turn it on, it's going to kind of always be compressing to some degree in that band. Mm. So instead, I like to take it off auto mode and set a threshold so that it's only doing the work when that particular you know problem area jumps in. Um, so again, it's really just a, a problem solver. Yeah. Yeah. I, as for wind, and that's about, I mean, really, I so rarely use it. And I want to say I I am a bit of a purist and a minimalist, and I think that there are probably cases where I could get over myself a little bit and use tools like that more judiciously, and they might benefit the final sound a little bit. But the 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 byproducts of that approach would kind of haunt me. <laughs> <laughs> like I would hear it and it would kind of bug me, you know what I mean? And yeah, yeah. And the same way, like I had mentioned that, um, you know, these taming resonances doesn't make sense. It doesn't mean that if you slap Gullfoss on a mix that it's going to sound worse necessarily, right? So, so there's a difference between kind of having a philosophical problem and, you know, agreeing that it has its uses or it can uh, flatter a, a mix. I don't know. It's mm. so funny. You see the, the guys, at least what I've seen in mastering is they'll, they'll put it on, they'll be, oh, we just need this little tiny bit. And it's like so much you can barely hear it. It's like, okay, yeah. really? Do we, did that really add anything? Yeah. So, 
Absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think I'm very much uh, in the similar camp to yourself with regards to the minim minimalist approach and not over or complicating things. And from what you've said there, and I don't know, I, uh, from what I've seen and experienced, is, is there a case to say that as when we're mixing or rather than being creative, um, are we, are we, are, 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 is it that we're just seeking problems and trying to fix something that might ne not necessarily exist because we've got all, because you see all these, like you mentioned there with ozone and these various different modules that you can put in ozone. And then you're seeing them, you think, oh, I need to use that. I need to go and find a problem <laughs> so I can use this module to show that I can use ozone because we have all these things. And then is there a case to say that we might be mixing by rote rather than actually creatively, if that makes sense? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that's a danger for me. I think it can really be a danger if you're mm. actually using presets. You yeah. know what I mean? Like presets on EQ and compression don't really make sense. I mean, maybe a preset, uh, you know, on a compressor for drums is a starting point for the attack and release, but even that's going to, you know, change things. But but yeah, 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 there is there is a mindset that we need to just get in there and and maximize like uh, wider is always better right i want more mm -hmm. width um <laughs> it's you know or even even things that that are helpful for example monoizing your low end yeah um I, do we have to do it with every track like i admit like i i use um baseline pro i don't know if you know tone projects baseline pro I know of Tone Projects, but not of, not of that particular. Oh, man, their stuff is great. So they, they're mm. the same company that make the Unison Mastering Compressor. They also have um, Kelvin, which is a, um, a dual-stage saturator that's really cool. But um, anyway, like I like to check mixes with Baseline Pro, but I don't feel like everything, unless it's I know it's going to vinyl, like not everything has to be in mono below 100 hertz, you know, if it if it doesn't make it sound better um so yeah i think we can maybe get a little dogmatic sometimes and and or want to use all the toys or i mean i don't do this but i could imagine going so far as to create a a checklist you know for mm -hmm. each element or each bus of things we need to put on or check for or um fine tune and as long i think at the end as long as you're using your ears and as long as you don't you're not listening to the same track a thousand times and then trusting your ears because we know how that works, right? You've, you've got yeah. to kind of get in and get out to some degree um, before you lose your objectivity. So I think if you can trust your ears, work quickly, uh, and in a perfect world, set it aside and come back in a month and double check the mix, then um, you're probably not going to get go too far off base. No, brilliant. And... Um it's, it's great that you mentioned that about uh, monoing instruments below 100 hertz, 80 hertz, because I had um, uh, this exact conversation with someone uh, earlier today, actually. Uh, we were talking about uh, the low end and how they wanted it to sound in a particular way. And I looked at the, the project and, can you show me what you're doing in this particular instrument? Can you show me what, you, what you're doing in that in that frequency spectrum? And it's, I pretty much you said exactly what you said there is you don't, necessarily there is no rule that says that you everything has to be mono there maybe try try it not in mono and see what happens and I, I, once again <laughs> i effectively said what you said if it sounds good it is good really? you know um so it's brilliant and it's, it's great when i when i <laughs> it's great for me when i give someone that information that advice and then i hear it from someone that uh, produce uh mix and master and energy such as yourself as well so <laughs> it's great, great that, I, that my my uh, advice is sort of <laughs> backed up there which is brilliant um but i'm well aware of time here so what, what i wanted to move on to next because this information has been fantastic is you've released a single uh the serious one mm. maybe just a bit of information on that one there can you just explain to our audience a bit about that particular song the start of the song um and what they can expect if they haven't heard it yeah that so this was a tricky mix um and it started in a weird way i was kind of looking for some different drum sounds and uh i pulled in a 606 from ableton and instead of just pulling in the drum samples i think i pulled in a pattern like i don't know if it was from some other source but um and it had all these crazy like 16th note cymbal hits that was just 
it was totally overbearing, but it was kind of cool too. And so I worked from that and, you know, eliminated half of the, the hits, but so that that's kind of where that one started from. And I'm not ever going to use a 606 again because the, <laughs> the kick is this weird blobby, pillowy, indistinct thunk. <laughs> yeah. That was really hard to, to get to work. Um, so yeah. Um, as far as the, the songwriting, like, well, okay. So I was a pretty, and I still am pretty insecure about the vocals. Like that's the lowest I've sung on a track and I feel like I'm, I don't know, I'm tempted to re-sing it for the album. We'll, we'll see if I do that. Um, and it's, it's kind of a love song about unrequited love, but I would compare it to the, uh, the police is every breath you take where you, mm. you know, you hear it and you're like, Oh, that's a beautiful song. And then it's like, Oh, can't you see you belong to me? I'm like, mm. like it's, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'll be watching you. You're like, wait, <laughs> maybe there's more to this than I, yeah. than I realized it's yep. the same, same kind of thing. So the narrator is an unreliable narrator, which is always tricky, right? You're writing words that you expect the audience to know that what the person is saying isn't actually true. Um, so it's a it's about unrequited love. It's a little bit stalkerish, or maybe I think it could be potentially interpreted as the the protagonist is maybe on the spectrum, or you know, just not kind of not understanding the situation socially in the way that we would hope it would be um, mm. taken. So it's it's kind of a tricky tricky song, but if you just want to take it as a as a very pleasant love song, it certainly works that way too. Yeah, I love what you mentioned there about uh, the police and every breath you take because it is one of those ones where actually if you think, if you listen and sort of digest the lyrics a bit more, it, it has <laughs> there are slightly sinister connotations uh, <laughs> surrounding that song. So it's, yeah, it's it's interesting that. Um, but brilliant. No, audience, do go check out the serious one as well. Um, it's a fantastic song, as, as they all are. And obviously I'll put links to um, your band camp and whatnot so the audience can go away and, and listen to those as well. Uh, Brian, we've got one question here, um, which is from our Facebook community. Now, this is from um, a member called Tim Woodruff. Oh. And I think you might have possibly answered this earlier. Um, but his question is, what is the biggest mastering mistake that you see people making and what would you do to fix it? Yeah, I guess it's that's I would go with uh, <laughs> why well, I, I said two already, right? Uh, mm. Mixing through compression and limiting and feeling like you need to use every module in ozone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just if, if you're not look, look, my first five years as a mastering engineer, like, I mean, I'd like to think it was good because I probably did at the time, but it's not, it wasn't that good. It really takes a long time to be able to dial in the compression on an entire mix. And I mm -hmm. kid you not, like I, I am, adjusting the thousandth <laughs> on the threshold, like the, the right. Cause it'll usually be uh, three digits after the decimal point. Mm -hmm. And that last digit, you wouldn't think it would matter. You'd think it's trivial. And I thought I was fooling myself for a long time, but uh, it really makes a difference. Like there's just a sweet spot and it is so small. Um, and like I said, I thought I was fooling myself. There was a um, a client, uh, Craig Space March in Australia. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he has he has great stuff. He used to work for Universal. He may still mm. do that. And he had the ears to really detect it. So I would adjust things by that thousandth, and he would reliably say, "Nope, nope, that was." <laughs> You know, um, <laughs> so it was because seriously, I thought, OK, you know, because you've had that right where you're, you're mixing and you realize later that the EQ is in bypass. But you <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We've so, all been there. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. The, the So my point is that uh, it is a very delicate process if you're not confident in what you're doing. And if you haven't been mastering for a long time, you're probably not doing your best. At least try to minimize the potential damage. Don't compress more than, you know, one to two dB tops. Any mm -hmm. problem you hear, if it can be fixed in the mix, fix it in the mix. Um, I uh, would say don't master louder than negative nine luffs. Mm -hmm. uh, if, 
the th- that can be a really good test actually. If if I have a mix that I pull in, and I I master it at a volume that sounds about right, and then I pull it and I look and it's like wow, it's like negative seven luffs. That probably means that there's work to be done in the mix. Like things aren't yeah. balanced right. If you've got a good mix, the exception I would say is a sustained like respace, something like that that's gonna soak up a lot of energy. Mm-hmm. Um, but for most mixes, if if you can't get it sounding good at negative nine luffs, then you've got you you know go back into the mix. And for me, I that means you know bringing down the kick, bringing down the bass. I always want more, but I got to bring it down um, because that's that's where a lot of that energy gets eaten up. Mm. Excellent advice. Yeah, brilliant. And it's great that you mentioned that about uh, the negative nine luffs as well, because um, that is. There's so much information online with regards to streaming platforms and, mm. and and advice in sort of air quotes regarding what levels should be and whatnot. So it's great to hear that you you as a mastering engineer you're you're doing that you're doing the mastering process and then looking at the level. Um, there's sort of after as well. I've got one quick question with regards to this. So now you mentioned there you sort of after the five years you sort of progress and whatnot. Do you? Uh, it's it's a weird question, but do you hear m- like music differently when you're in mastering mode? If someone sends you a song, <laughs> yeah. do you? It's it's a weird question, but no, do you hear man, it absolutely. differently yeah. to, to uh, analyzing a mix? Yeah, I I definitely do because what what happens quite often is I will master a record and then the artist will say, "All right, so which is your favorite song, or what, or do you have you know? Can you put it in a sequence for me?" And mm. you'd be surprised at how many artists ask me to sequence their albums. Um, but my first, you know, it takes me takes me aback because I just have not listened that way at all. And if you ask me what the best song is, it's going to be the one with the best mix, right? <laughs> at, that, yeah, yeah. at that stage. So yeah, I listen very, very differently. And I rarely comment on the music itself, um, you know, when I'm, when I'm mastering stuff i just don't yeah i did it almost doesn't even occur to me so yeah mm-hmm. it's very different interesting yeah it's uh it echoes a conversation once again i say this a lot because i've had so many conversations <laughs> yes, uh yeah. but yeah um exactly that and then how music is heard differently by mastering engineers this has been brilliant i know we've um we've gone on a tangent as i regularly do on <laughs> these episodes because i uh a guest will say something and then immediately i'll make a note and think oh i want to ask this question i end up going down a rabbit hole and then, and then totally disregarding all the notes i've made prior to the interview but no this is Fantastic information, and our audience is going to get loads out of this. Um, this is great, and it's going to feed in nicely to like the mix engineer mastering mini series that I'm sort of um, collating and putting together. So oh, this is perfect. fantastic, um, Brian. Uh, where can our audience find you online? Where's the best place to go? Well, uh, ColorTheory.com would be probably the best entrance. So a lot of like I'm not very up on social media. Like I'm not doing videos. I mean, this is, this isn't great. I mean, I realize I, I should probably do better, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm not, on t- I, I have my account on TikTok, but I'm not posting anything on TikTok. I don't do reels. The, the way to really keep up with me and get to know me would be to go to colortheory.com. I've got a mailing list subscription there. I mm-hmm. send you five of my best songs for free. And um, that's the way I update people is, is through email um, of course, the next level then is becoming a patron, and that starts at three dollars. And you, as we discussed, get a new track every month, and many of those go on to be released at some point, but uh, some don't. And uh, you have input into kind of the process and what ends up getting released, and picking artwork and fun stuff like that. So it's a good time. Fantastic. That Patreon idea is uh, is brilliant. I love that idea that you're sending music out. And then I suppose your audience then, they feel connected and part of the process because they're having an input, which is which is fantastic. Yeah, it's great. It's listening. great for me, like uh, cover art specifically, like, okay, pick a, <laughs> pick a design. And, and that gets a lot of people really involved. And I don't know if you saw this. Um, Spotify, I, don't, I hope it comes soon, but announced something about uh, connecting with Patreon so that we can have patron exclusive material on Spotify. Oh. So that would be amazing. Imagine 
you know, I've got a patron only album that, yeah, cause right. Brilliant. They're listening on Spotify too. And they've got a, you know, they can listen to my music through a podcast link, which is still cool. Mm. They can listen on their phone, but to listen on Spotify and better yet to have people who aren't patrons see that they can unlock this album by becoming a patron. It's a, uh, yeah, it's really exciting. I, I'm, I hope it actually happens. Yeah, definitely. It, it, it sort of sparks the creative fire in me, really, thinking about it now. I wonder if they'll do the same for podcasts. That's something I have to look Ooh. at, look into. Yeah, because yeah, I'm thinking exclusive. It's probably something I should discuss on air, but <laughs> it's exclusive <laughs> podcast uh, episodes and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, that's that's further down the line. That's for another day. <laughs> um, have you got any key dates or any anything like that you'd like to share with the audience? Uh, mm. This episode will go live, I believe, if memory serves, sort of around the beginning of April. Okay. Well, uh, April will be the first month I take off from releasing a track in a long time. And that's because I mentioned the Ghost Again thing. That was mm. the fifth release in five weeks. It was insane. Yeah. And I need a break and you need a break. And mm. uh, so, but what I'm going to try to do, and this is the first time I'm saying it out loud, so now it may have to happen, is <laughs> I want to do another um, free plus shipping and handling offer. So I've got, I was thinking of giving away CD copies of The Majesty of Our Broken Past, which is kind of my big synthwave album um, mm. from 2018. And um, so hopefully people can keep an eye out for that. It'll be on colortheory.com. So the idea is the CD's free. You just got to cover shipping, which isn't too bad in the U.S. But if you're not in the U.S., it is bad and it's not my fault. <laughs> but yeah. um, and then the next actual release will be She's Made of Wires in the beginning of May, of course, on Bandcamp Friday. Ah, brilliant. Excellent stuff. Um, Brian, thank you so much for spending the time with me today. It's been great. I appreciate um, you've had to you get up early and whatnot and um, <laughs> squeeze this into your day. Um, yeah. yeah, it's 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 one of those ones where the the podcast is around the world, but um, the the times suit me and not necessarily <laughs> the people I'm talking to yeah, a lot of the time. Fair enough. Uh, no, I really yeah. enjoyed it. No, thank you for having me. Yeah. No, no, it's been brilliant. It's been great to pick your brains and sort of hear more about your your story at the beginning and also your advice with regards to music production, mixing, and and specifically mastering as well. Because I think this year on the podcast. Um, the previous sort of 60 episodes have, haven't really touched on mastering at all. Hmm. And um, it's been great that in 2023, there's been a, this episode, there was a previous one uh, earlier in March, I think it was. So it's great to now have some mastering insight as well, because I know there are a lot of producers out there and artists who are doing it themselves and not necessarily know where to begin or or have been misinformed. So it's, it's fantastic to have you on chat about that as well. Um, so I know they're going to get a lot out of it. So brilliant. Once again, Ryan, a big thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. I'll uh, speak to you soon.